Well, thank you for taking the time out of your incredibly busy schedule oh, to, to talk to us about this. Uh, you released your first ad since uh, the election on April 18th, all positive, no mention of John Ossoff. Uh, what's the strategy there? You know, I just wanted the voters of the 6th District to be able to see the real me and um, be able to connect with that. As, as you know, Steve and I have lived in the 6th District for nearly 25 years, so the folks in the district know us, and I felt it was important for them to get to see the real me. Yeah. Now, John Ossoff released an ad today uh, criticizing your involvement with the Susan G. Komen Foundation, specifically uh, trying to cut funding for Planned Parenthood. And in fact, the, there's an OBGYN from Cobb County, I, I guess this was directed at women, her name is Mandy Fine, says, Karen Handel cut off funding for Planned Parenthood cancer screenings when she was an executive at Susan G. Komen. I don't usually get involved in politics, but as a doctor and a breast cancer survivor myself, what Karen Handel did is unforgivable. What's, mm -hmm. what's your response to what she well, said? Well, what I find unforgivable is John Ossoff, like so many liberals out there, once again using women as a wedge issue for the sake of politics. Um, people who know me know that I have been fighting for women and women's health for just about my entire career. And whether it is mentoring young women up the, the, in the world of, of business or my time at the White House working with Marilyn Quayle in the fight against breast cancer to advocating for more dollars to preserve dollars for breast and cervical screening to holding the hand and being the best friend I possibly can for my friends who have been fighting cancer. So, you know, I would like to ask, what has John Ossoff done? in the fight against breast cancer. What has John Ossoff done for women's health? And what I'm gonna do if I have the privilege of being the next congressman is fight for women and fight for more dollars for women's health, specifically the community health centers. If Mr. Ossoff spent a little more time in the sixth district, he might know that we don't even have a Planned Parenthood clinic in the sixth district, but we do have four community health centers and they are the front door for women's health. Okay. The Democrats, uh, the, the PACs, have also criticized you for uh, running six times for five different offices, suggesting that you run for yourself. What, what's your response to that charge? Well, I find that to be laughable from a career staffer like John Ossoff, who spent most of his time in Washington, D.C. I think that, you know, first of all, for women, it's really hard for women to come back from a loss and keep fighting and persevering. What it says about me is that I am resilient. Um, I have a heart for public service, and I would venture to say that if you talk to Newt Gingrich or Johnny Isaacson, they would tell you that they came back stronger and better for having been through tough campaigns and losing, and it made them better candidates and better prepared. Yeah, I do want to get to policy, but I, I have one last question sort of about the electoral sure. map and, and uh, the dynamics. Mitt Romney won your district, as I know you know, by mm -hmm. 23 points right. in 2012. Tom Price most recently by 24, his reelection in November, and Donald Trump by a point and a half over Hillary Clinton. So I guess the question is, how do you appeal to the folks who really like the president while at the same time gathering in those who, who aren't so sure? You know, my focus is appealing to the people of the 6th District and making sure that they know my track record of getting things done, whether as the uh, head of the Fulton County uh, Commission, whether as president and CEO of the North Fulton Chamber of Commerce, as secretary of state, as a successful businesswoman. That's what I think the people of the 6th want to know about. I understand that if I have this privilege, I'm not an extension of the White House. That's not to say that I'm not going to be supportive of the president when I can, but my number one responsibility and obligation is to be the fiercest advocate I can be for the people of the 6th District. Okay, that's fair enough, but you have suggested that if John Ossoff were elected, he would be an extension of, of Nancy Pelosi. Well, look at who's funding his campaign in and out. Um, look, this is a guy who was handpicked by Nancy Pelosi. Most people have never heard, heard of him before. He doesn't live in the 6th District. On the other hand, you have someone like myself who's been in the 6th District for nearly 25 years, serving the people of this community. They know me, they trust me, and I'll put my resume up against him any day. Oh, Let's talk about health care. Are you mm -hmm. satisfied that the bill in its current version that was passed by the Republican House 
does enough to protect people with pre-existing conditions. You know, and I'm glad that you asked about that because I know for you that's a very important issue and for me it is as well. I don't know if we've ever talked about it, but my sister was born with very, very serious health issues and spent the first three, almost four years of her life in the Children's Medical Center. I um, so that. I take this very seriously. I would never want my sister or anyone to be trapped in a job or fall through the cracks because of a pre-existing condition. Unfortunately, when it comes to health care, um, too often the political rhetoric gets really, really high and people try to use this as a wedge issue as well. The fact is that within the bill that passed uh, Congress in the House a uh, week before last, that um, provision making sure that no one can be denied insurance because of pre-existing conditions was maintained. That's a fact, but somehow that gets lost out there in the rhetoric. It is a fact that the bill has pro other protections for individuals with pre-existing conditions, high, dollars for high-risk pools, um, safety net, dollars for the safety net program. Mm -hmm. Will there be other things added to it on the Senate side? Maybe, and I think if we can enhance it more, that would be great. Um, one thing I do hope the Senate addresses is making sure that any state like Georgia that did not do an expansion of Medicaid isn't penalized for not having done that. So we're working through the process, and I'm optimistic um, Obamacare, the exchanges, they are on the brink of implosion. Um, Steve and I get our insurance off of the exchange. We don't get any subsidies, we're small business owners, and we've watched our insurance premium go from about $400 a month to well over $1,200 a month with tens, uh, I think it's like $10,000 um, in a deductible. And we don't have a choice in providers. Mm -hmm. We're about to have only one provider on the exchange. So I'm glad that Congress acted. Was it perfect? No. But if we waited until these exchanges fell apart completely, that would really hurt families and businesses even more than they already are. Yeah. Now, President Trump has said everyone should be taken care of. Uh, so just in general terms, do you feel like the debate is moving in the direction of where people, a majority of people think that the, the quality of the health care that you get should not depend on how much money you have? Well, I think that's always been a premise in America that your quality shouldn't be driven about your income or your circumstances in life. Um, so I, I, I think that Republicans have really been approaching this with that mindset. Okay. But that's not the same as a universal plan, um, universal coverage. What we want is to have a market-driven, um, patient choice-driven type of a system. Um, the biggest lie of politics was if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Sure. That's what we were told by Obama and the Democrats, and it wasn't true. Yeah, so we need to get back to giving people real choice. I can tell you that if you're on the exchange in Georgia with one provider left, with the most limited uh, scope of doctors in that network, you don't have choice. Yeah, there's no competition. Uh, on the subject of tax reform, mm -hmm. do you think that tax cuts pay for themselves, the whole Laffer curve idea, or do you think there have to be spending cuts to, to keep from blowing a hole in the deficit? Well, obviously, we have to do both. Um, have pro-growth initiatives like tax reform with lower lower taxes on the income side, especially for middle income families that really ha are still hurting and trying to come out of the great recession that we had, but at the same time drawing down corporate rates. We still though have to keep our eye on the ball on the budget side as well and start to tame the deficit so that then we can begin to deal with the debt. So I think the two go hand in hand. Um, certainly as we start to have a um, uh, lower corporate rates, lower personal rates, especially, by the way, um, individual rates because we have to make sure we keep those S-Corps and LLCs as part of that mix as we're doing tax reform because if we don't, we'll cut out a huge, huge percentage of the business population out there. But as we do that, we can start to inject some real growth into our economy. Um, one and a half percent growth is pitiful, it's anemic. We need to get back in the three to four percent range. And as we do that, we'll see obviously more revenues, which gives us a little more latitude on the budget side. Okay, let me ask you about something that's a particular expertise of yours. When you were Secretary of State, you basically ran uh, the state's electoral system, mm -hmm. right? President Trump has insisted, I was gonna say suggested, but he's, he's 
flat out said that he would have won the popular vote had it not been for three million illegal votes cast uh, in November. The Republican Secretary of State of Ohio rejected that premise. What, what, what's your take on all of that? You know, I know the president has called for a task force to look at this. Right. I think that's a good idea. Why not? If he believes there was um, a, lot of, a lot of illegal vote, let's take a look at that and get a real answer. Let's, let's follow the facts. What I can say about Georgia and the integrity of our elections is this. We have a photo ID law that makes sure that when a person votes, that individual is who they say they are. And you were part of making that that's happen. That's right, that's right. That was implemented under my time. And I think it is um, instructive to point out that Georgia's photo ID law and Indiana's photo ID law, they are models in the country and remain standing, having gone through many, many tests in the courts, and not a single person has come forward to say they weren't able to vote. So uh, that's not the same as some other states. Okay. Because if, if tens of thousands of people, and that's what it would take, mm -hmm. had voted illegally in Georgia when you were Secretary of State, you would have known it. I think I would have, yes. Okay. I believe I would have. All right. Let's talk about uh, the firing of James Comey. Uh, mm -hmm. Senator John McCain has called for a special select congressional committee to, to look into any potential collusion, of which there's no proof at this point, obviously, right. uh, between the Trump campaign and Russia now that... Uh, Director Comey has been fired. Others have called for a special prosecutor. What do you think ought to happen? Well, we already have three concurrent investigations. The House side, the Senate, and the FBI. So let's let those investigations go forward, get the facts, and then let's follow the facts wherever they take us. Okay. Uh, getting back to some of the, the closer electoral politics, there's a very conservative district uh, precinct up in Milton where Tom Price won by 84 uh, percent and Donald Trump by 72. What, what do you say to the, to the 12 percent who, who didn't uh, vote for Donald Trump to, to get them to come your way? Not that you're a, a surrogate of Donald Trump, but, uh, and, and to women in particular who seem to be tending toward John Ossoff. You know, what I say to, and, and I'm not going to make a message specific for any particular group. This is the people of the 6th District. They are friends and people that I have served, whether as chairman of the county commission, as secretary of state, as my time as chamber president. What I want the people of the 6th District to know is that if I have the privilege of serving them, they are going to have a fighter for them so that we get real tax reform and tax relief for middle class families and businesses, especially small businesses so that we get a repeal of that estate tax that so cripples a family-owned businesses for generations so that they can really thrive, so that we do do the right thing on health care and get that back into the hands of the state so that you can choose the best doctors for you and your family so that we can roll back an onerous regulatory climate for people to know that I'm going to be there to serve them. And you compare my record and my resume to that of my opponent, and the, the differences are crystal clear. Yeah, I try to put myself in your shoes running what's almost a national race mm -hmm. uh, in the course of just a couple of months uh, after the, the first go round, and uh, I have to think that one of the things that must keep you up at night is hoping that people actually come out to vote on June 20th, summer vacation, the whole thing. It's, the timing's a little odd. You know, honestly, I really sleep very soundly. Uh, well, after, after <laughs> it's a long, long days, days right, every right, day. Right, right, but right. no, I, I hear what you're asking. It is going to all be all about voter turnout, and um, you know, just with the way things uh, fell um, in terms of the calendar, with uh, then Congressman Price, now Secretary Price's nomination and confirmation, it is what it is. So right. everyone just has to work hard. What I'm seeing is a great deal of enthusiasm uh, from people in the 6th District because there's been you know, really some great legacy of leadership from Newt Gingrich to Johnny Isaacson to Tom Price. And people want that kind of common sense uh, conservatism, someone who's going to be a doer, um, get in there and hit the ground running on the issues that really matter, transportation, tax reform all of those issues. Yeah, I mean, to your point, this has been, as you know, a Republican district since 1979. So, so why do you think it's even a race? Well, special elections are called special elections for a reason. And I think part of uh, what transpired is on the Democrat side, they had a coronation 
Right. On the Republican side, we had a very competitive 11-way primary, and now we are in head-to-head -head, uh, for myself against a very liberal Democrat with a flimsy, inflated resume. So I think you're going to see Republicans turn out in force and individuals in the district who really want a common sense, can-do, get-the-job-done conservative in this seat. Yeah. Last question, just uh, as a matter of curiosity. You came so close to winning the Republican nomination for governor in 2010. I don't have to tell you. I mean, you had <laughs> most votes in the first round and, and just barely lost the runoff. Did you consider waiting until next year? Because, you know, being an executive and being a congressperson seems like two very different things. You know, you have to look at the opportunities that are in front of you, and Steve and I spent a great deal of time talking through this. I spent a lot of time talking with now Secretary Price just about whether or not I could make a difference in this role um, at this time, and I believe I can for this reason. Republicans are moving from, I'll call it a vocal opposition time period, into a governing time period, and that's what I do. I like to get things done, and I know I can hit the ground running in helping to do some very good things for the district. Yeah, it's been kind of a rocky transition in Washington in that very respect, hasn't it? Well, if you think about it, so many of the individuals serving in both the House and the Senate, they've never served with a Republican president. Right. And so it is a different style and a different mindset to go from vocal opposition to governing. But I think you saw the passage of, of the health care bill. Next up in, on the, in the House is working on Dodd-Frank. Then you'll see tax reform. So I feel very good that everyone's getting their sea legs, so to speak. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate, appreciate it. appreciate you being here.